Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Thank you for participating in our webinar series towards clean and circular cities in Africa. Uh, my name is Misato Zili, working at UNEP International Environment Technology Center, and I'm moderating today's webinar. Before the webinar starts, I would like to give you um, a couple of housekeeping announcements. Uh, we have interpretation functions today, and please select either English or French from the interpretation function at the bottom of your screen. And if you like to ask questions during the Q&A sessions in English, please write them in the Q&A function. And in French, um, those of you who speak French, uh, please use the raise hand function and ask your questions um, when uh, out loud when called on. Okay, um, so the COVID-19 pandemic imposed additional burden to African cities who are already overwhelmed by the rapidly increasing amount of solid waste to manage. And the pandemic has resulted in increased amount of mixed waste, including infectious waste and plastic waste. The today's webinar, which is the second webinar of the series, addresses the impact of COVID-19 on healthcare waste. This is the joint webinar series between UN Habitat and UNEP and the, the African Green City platform. And I would like now would like to invite Ms. Nao Takeuchi, who is a waste expert at UN Habitat for her opening remarks. Over to you now. Thank you very much for your introduction, Misato. Hello. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Nao Takeuchi. Uh, who Waste Management Specialist from the UN Habitats, and a welcome to the African Clean Cities Platform webinar series number two, COVID Waste, what additional challenge was imposed on African cities? So first, I would like to introduce what African Clean Cities Platform is. African Clean Cities Platform is a knowledge sharing and investment promotion platform for the improved solid waste management in Africa, and a, which was established in 2017 with the representatives from 24 African countries, JICA, Ministry of Environment, Yokohama City, UNEP and UN Habitat. Now the platform grew to a network of 99 cities from 42 countries across the continent and we are aiming to realize a clean and healthy cities in Africa by 2030 in the framework of uh, SDGs. So under this platform, UN Habitat last year conducted data collection in line with the SDG indicator 11.6.1, proportion of a municipal solid waste collected and managed in control facilities out of total municipal solid waste generated by cities in more than 10 cities in Africa. And the data collected showed many African cities are struggling with achieving this SDG especially with the low waste collection rate, open dumping, and then burning of waste. And in, in addition to that, the COVID-19 pandemic, as Misato already mentioned, imposed additional burden for African cities to manage the municipal solid waste management. And the pandemic also resulted in increased amount of the mixed waste, potentially infectious waste, and, and also plastic waste. And then this also imposed of, of um, um, curfew where the workers, waste, waste management collection workers cannot work outside of the curfew time and so on. So today's webinar addresses the impact of COVID-19 on healthcare waste and introduces relevant technologies and solutions to deal with such waste through UNEP's compendium of technologies for treatment, destruction of healthcare waste. So I hope you all will enjoy the webinar and learn from today's prominent panelists' presentations and discussions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nao. Um, now, before we move on to the presentation, let me invite all the speakers to turn on the camera so we can just take a photo, um, a group photo. Yeah. Okay. I hope everyone is present. Um, okay, I'll count number three, so maybe you can smile. Okay, three, two, one. Okay, I hope everyone takes the screenshot. Okay, thank you so much. 
Okay, now let me invite the first distinguished speaker, Dr. Jorge Emanuel. He's a Jansen professor in the Institute of Environmental and Marine Science and College of, en uh, College of Engineering at Siliman University, Philippines. He was chief technical advisor for the UNDP and consultant to the WHO, government ministries and non-governmental non organization in over 40 countries. He's the author of many publications, including UNEP and WHO regarding healthcare waste treatment. And UNEP is now currently working with them for the new handbook on healthcare waste management and treatment technologies. Uh, Dr. Emmanuel, over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Uh, Dilly. I, um, let me set up my application. Um, do, do you see my slides? Yeah, we can see you. Okay, for some reason, I can't see them. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, let me... Let me see what happened. Uh, let me stop sharing and try it again. Okay, uh, I hope that's uh, working. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Uh, I too would like to thank uh, UNEP, UN Habitat, and the African Clean Cities platform for the opportunity to speak at this. Today, I will talk about the global impacts of COVID-19 waste um, and uh, what are some of the solutions. At the start of the COVID pandemic, Reports from around the world describe the impact of COVID waste on cities. Countries reported between 17% to 450% increase in the amounts of infectious waste compared to before the pandemic. Many cities reported problems of limited storage capacity, resulting in waste piling up in hospitals. Many service companies were overwhelmed by the high volumes of infectious waste. And importantly, many countries face difficulties due to the lack of or uh, insufficient capacity for treatment. Many developing countries try to cope with the growing amounts of infectious waste by burning waste on the ground or in burn barrels or by dumping the waste in waste dumps without any treatment or by burning them in badly designed or poorly operated incinerators. The lack of proper healthcare waste management is a major concern. Mismanaged infectious waste can cause the spread of diseases among health professionals, uh, waste workers, the community, and waste pickers, especially if they are not provided with proper personal protection equipment or PPE. The most common mode of disease transmission from healthcare waste is through needle stick injuries, being stuck by a contaminated needle because of inadequate gloves. Another health impact is due to emissions from incinerators, especially the pollutants that you cannot see, such as dioxins and furans, and fine particulate matter or PM2.5. Dioxins remain in the environment for hundreds of years, and they're very toxic at extremely low temperatures, uh, sorry, extremely low concentrations, and they are linked to cancers, harm on the fetus and children, reproductive disorders, and many other effects. Fine particulate matter is linked to heart disease and effects on the lungs. In fact, one study showed that people with COVID have a higher risk of dying when they are also exposed to fine particulate matter. Many studies clearly show higher rates of cancers, miscarriages, 
male and female reproductive disorders, etc., among people living within five kilometers of a waste incinerator. Because of the dangers of dioxins, 185 countries are now part of the Stockholm Convention on Persistent Organic Pollutants. The Stockholm Convention specifically identified incineration of medical waste as one of the major global sources of dioxins. Countries are obliged under the uh, treaty to reduce or where possible eliminate dioxin emissions. Under the guidelines of the Stockholm Convention, dioxin should be limited to 0.1 nanograms TEQ per normal cubic meter. This can be achieved by operating the incinerators at very high temperatures. And because dioxins are formed when the gases cool down, by also by installing air pollution control equipment on the incinerator. The pollution control combination that includes a gas quencher, bag filters, and high efficiency scrubbers, such as those shown on the top photos, uh, the photos uh, at the top, may keep dioxins below the limit. Incinerator ash is also toxic. So under the Stockholm Convention, the ash must be disposed in a safe manner, such as in hazardous waste landfills. Another concern with incinerator incineration relates to climate change. Incinerators produce 1.7 times more total carbon than coal-fired power plants, 2.5 times more carbon than oil-fired uh, power plants, and 4.2 times more carbon than gas-fired plants per kilowatt hour generated. Thus, incineration is the most carbon-intensive form of energy from waste. A first step towards solving the problem of COVID-related waste is to first understand some basic uh, information. This is one chapter in the upcoming new UNEP handbook. The upcoming UNEP handbook has detailed information on how to estimate how much COVID waste is produced. Examples are shown here. You'll notice it's a range. Some countries have lower amounts of COVID waste for confirmed case or per uh, COVID patient compared to others because those hospitals have stronger enforcement of classification rules, stricter segregation, and practice waste prevention. A problem that cities around the world now face is the huge amounts of face masks in the environment. The chart you see is taken from the recent WHO World Health Organization report on COVID waste. It shows the thousands of tons of masks, gloves, and other PPE exported to different regions of the world through the UN system as of November 2021. Purchases outside the UN system are even larger, so the actual figures globally are many times higher. The highest number of gloves and non-essential PPE are in Africa. At the bottom are examples of equations that you will find in the, in the new UNEP handbook on how to estimate the amounts of face masks and other PPE waste in a country or a city. <clears throat> uh, because of time, I cannot discuss the equations, but I hope you will get a chance to read the details in the upcoming UNEP handbook. The UNEP handbook also discusses the many types of COVID waste in addition to just regular healthcare waste. COVID increased the, num the, the amounts of PPE waste, mainly face masks and gloves, but also gowns, face shields, aprons, etc. Waste is also produced from three types of COVID testing and from COVID-related vaccination, as broken out, down in detail in the handbook. Estimates of the amount of waste per rapid test or per vaccination are shown in this slide. The graph on the right shows the breakdown of COVID waste 
by material constituents. So you can see 77% of COVID waste is plastic, followed by 12% paper and 6% glass. This leads me to an important discussion, the global crisis of plastic pollution. As many of you already know, we have produced more than 6 billion tons of plastic waste. Plastic waste will remain in our environment for hundreds of years. When plastic pieces are still large, they injure turtles, seals, birds, and many other wildlife. After many, de many decades, the plastics break down into microplastics, which are then eaten by fish, as shown in the bottom picture, and in other, um, uh, other animals, and they enter the food chain. Because microplastics absorb toxic materials from the environment, human, humans today and in coming generations will be exposed to toxic substances from the microplastics that are now in our food and drinks. The first step in solving the plastic pollution problem, especially in healthcare, is to understand plastics. Disposable plastics make up about 85% of hospital medical equipment. The UNEP handbook provides tables such as the one shown on the right, which details where all the plastics can be found in hospitals. It lists all the types of plastics, which are shown here as examples using their acronyms. And there's also a UNEP uh, table in the UNEP handbook with simple methods to help distinguish between the different plastics. This is important because part of the solution is to identify the plastics in hospitals and healthcare facilities and phase them out, replacing them as much as we can with more sustainable materials. Let us now talk about the solutions. Given the short time, I will just provide some highlights and I hope you will read the details in the upcoming UNEP handbook. The handbook, by the way, will be available for free via the UNEP website. First, let us discuss the framework for the solutions to the waste crisis. Many of you are already familiar with the waste management hierarchy, which is shown on the left. At the top of the hierarchy is source reduction, followed by reuse, recycling, recovery, treatment, and disposal. But the world is now realizing that this waste management hierarchy is not enough. We need to change our thinking from a linear economy to a circular economy. A circular economy views the problem as that of resource management. That is, we need to ensure that the value of our resources are preserved for future generations. That means we have to prevent the creation of waste to begin with. So this is reflected in the zero waste hierarchy, which is shown on the right. We must move from a wasteful society. We must learn to refuse unnecessary materials that will quickly become waste. And we must rethink and redesign our products so they can be reused for a long time. Under the zero waste hierarchy, the top priority is to refuse, rethink, and redesign, followed by reuse, uh, reduce, reuse, and repurpose, and then recycle and compost, followed by recovery of materials, and finally, proper management of what remains, the residual waste. The new hierarchy rejects processes that prohibit the recovery of materials that have high environmental impact that worsen the climate crisis and impede the transition to a circular economy. Under the zero waste hierarchy, incineration and landfilling of unstabilized waste are not acceptable. The top of the uh, zero waste hierarchy is waste prevention. Um, excuse me, is waste uh, prevention. Um, examples of waste prevention are replacing non-critical disposable 
plastics in hospitals with reusable alternatives of which uh, many already exist. Hospitals can also ban non-predictable plastic items in their stores, cafeterias, and shops. Environmental preferable purchasing, environment in, sorry, environmentally preferable purchasing is another important approach and it's described in the handbook. WHO and other organizations are now asking hospitals to use a rational approach to PPE usage. That is, PPE should not be used in healthcare activities where it is not needed. This is an important step in preventing unnecessary waste. Source reduction is also important. At the start of the pandemic, many hospitals treated all healthcare waste as infectious. This is why huge volumes of infectious waste were created, in some cases 10 times as much as before the pandemic. Take a look at the table on the right. It shows the major categories of microorganisms that cause diseases. Some are very difficult to destroy and need special treatment. But you'll notice that SARS-CoV-2, the virus responsible for COVID, is at the bottom of the list. That means, that means it is among the easiest microorganisms to destroy. So if the standard procedures for wastes uh, from other diseases work well in the hospital, why treat COVID waste as if it needs special treatment? So here's the key message. There is no reason to stir all healthcare waste from the pandemic as infectious. Instead, follow the basic guidelines on waste classification and segregation because they work perfectly well with COVID. This will significantly reduce infectious waste at the source. Reuse is also a high priority in the hierarchy. Hospitals need to realize that items that in the past were disinfected or sanitized and then used again, such as plates, utensils, gowns, linens, etc., used by patients, should continue to be uh, disinfected, sanitized, and reused. The list shown on the left shows how easy it is to destroy the virus. For example, an item contaminated with very high amounts of COVID-2 COVID virus can be completely decontaminated simply by soaking it in 1% bleach, 1% bleach for five minutes, or soaking it in 2% soap solution for 10 minutes, or putting it in hot water at 56 degrees for 36 minute, uh, 30 minutes. 56 degrees, by the way, is the temperature of hot tea. The water does not even have to be boiling to destroy the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Leaving the item under the direct sun at noontime in countries near the equator will destroy 99% of the virus in two hours. These scientific studies are summarized in many pages of tables found in the new UNEP handbook. This data can be used to develop decontamination procedures to sanitize items for reuse, thereby reducing COVID waste. This slide shows a possible decontamination and reuse procedure based on scientific evidence. This procedure can be used for durable PPE, such as heavy duty rubber gloves, face shields, aprons, gloves, uh, gowns, etc. Um, you could read the procedure for yourself, uh, but I should point out that the handbook discusses in detail the particular case of N95 or FFP2 or KN94 face masks, whichever face masks, respirators are being used in your country, and for surgical and medical gloves, because some of these procedures can actually reduce the ability of the mask to filter the virus. It could affect the fit of the face mask, or it could even cause holes in some of the surgical gloves. So there's a limit to how many times you can do this decontamination in general, but especially for the face masks and the surgical medical glove, depending on the process. Countries need to examine 
the many pages of data in the unit handbook and make determinations on what is safe and effective for the country uh, to allow decontamination and reuse, thereby reducing plastic waste. I should point out that decontamination and reuse of N95 masks and surgical gloves usually require approval by health uh, authorities. Next in the hierarchy is um, recycling. Here's another important message. Only 15% or so of healthcare waste is infectious or hazardous. As shown by the pie chart, the bulk of healthcare waste, about 85%, is non-risk, non-infectious, non-hazardous. The table that you see lists all the potentially recyclable material from hospitals and other healthcare facilities, and it's broken down according to different departments or services. We must support recycling, especially for glass and metal, which are infinitely recyclable, meaning they can be recycled forever without loss of quality. We also need to recycle plastics. Unfortunately, only three types of plastics are recyclable. Polyethylene terephthalate, or PET, high-density polyethylene, or HDPE, and polypropylene, or PP, which are numbers one, two, and five of the plastic number code, which you can find stamped at the bottom or side of some plastic products. Other plastics are too difficult or too dangerous to recycle. Plastics are not infinitely recyclable. Each time you melt plastic, you degrade its properties, so you have to add new plastic to be, be able to maintain a level of quality. That is why we need to replace plastics with sustainable alternatives to truly solve the plastic pollution problem. Composting or biodigestion of biodegradable hospital waste is, is another method of reducing waste from hospitals and healthcare facilities. There are many methods of composting, such as the rotating drum composter in the top photo. These can be used for food, garden waste, and other biodegradable and compostable materials from the hospitals. Biodigestion is another approach and has been used successfully not just for garden waste, etc., but also for pathological waste, especially for placenta waste from the maternity hospitals and maternity clinics. And the biogas that's produced can be used for cooking or heating water. This slide shows the basic elements of healthcare waste management. Hospitals should be familiar with this, with this, uh, with the basic elements beginning with a national or WHO classification system, which tells them which is infectious, which is a chemical hazard, which is non-infectious, etc. Hospitals then need to uh, keep infectious waste, sharp waste, hazardous chemical waste, and general non-risk, non-infectious waste separated. And they need to do this using color-coded and labeled containers. Infectious waste can only be stored for a limited time, as you can see in the slide. And there are also requirements for transport, treatment, and disposal. Let us now look at how to treat the infectious waste. Uh, details about the treatment technologies can be found in the upcoming UNEP handbook, which includes details of 116 specific technologies from 26 countries. First, there are four basic treatment approaches that a city or a region can take. One is a decentralized uh, approach wherein each hospital and clinic has its own treatment system. Two in a picture is a cluster approach wherein one hospital becomes the center of treatment for the smaller hospitals and for the clinics and uh, health posts around it. Three is a centralized approach, wherein one healthcare uh, treatment facility treats all of the healthcare waste in a region or in an entire city 
or in parts of a large city. Four, the fourth approach is a mobile treatment system wherein the treatment technology is mounted on a truck and then visits each hospital or cl clinic, treats the waste there, to convert it to general waste, and then moves on to the next hospital or clinic. All treatment technologies fall under one of these 11 categories, excluding the one at the bottom right. The ones on the left are called low heat thermal treatment technologies. They use steam or hot air to sterilize the waste. Incineration, pyrolysis, gasification, et cetera, are examples of high heat thermal technologies, which basically burn the waste to create hazardous ash and toxic air emissions, which need to be filtered out. There are also chemical technologies and there are also biological processes. Finally, at the bottom, I mentioned mechanical processes, but these processes do not treat the waste. They are only used to supplement the treatment technologies by reducing the volume of waste by as much as 85% and by making the waste unrecognizable. WHO, UNEP, and other international organizations, as, as well as the Stockholm Convention guidelines, recommend that a preference be given to the non-burn low heat treatment technologies. You should also consider alkaline hydrolysis and biological processes, which also have very low environmental impacts. Autoclaves are the most common non-incineration treatment technology. The UNEP handbook describes it, autoclaves in detail. What are the different types? how they work, the range of capacities they can handle, their maintenance requirements, et cetera. Basically, an autoclave is a pressure vessel wherein the infectious waste is exposed to high pressure steam at temperatures usually around 121 degrees to 135 degrees, in some cases even higher, to attain high disinfection level or even sterilization level. Sterilization level is the level used to sterilize surgical instruments. What that means is the waste that's coming out will be as sterile as the instruments used for surgery. Some hospitals use materials recovery sorting system to remove the sterilized recyclable materials, such as the sterilized glass bottles, the sterilized metals, sterilized recyclable plastics to sell it to the recyclers. What remains can be put through a shredder to reduce the volume as much as 85% and make the waste unrecognizable before being sent to a landfill. Here are four uh, photos of four sizes of autoclaves. At the top right is a photo of a very small portable autoclave that is used in small remote rural health posts. It can be used with a gas, electric or a wood stove. On the left are examples of small autoclaves, usually around 100 to 200 liters, including uh, photos of the ones that we used in West Africa during the Ebola epidemic. They are intended for use in a small or medium-sized hospital. The photos in the middle are medium-sized autoclaves, which can be used in large hospitals or can be used for cluster treatment, the cluster treatment approach. On the right are very large autoclaves capable of treating waste from an entire region or city. The autoclave at the bottom right, for example, treats all of the infectious waste in the whole city of Hanoi, Vietnam, with a population of more than 5 million people. In this slide, the left photos show hybrid autoclaves. Uh, they are more expensive than autoclaves, and they're also found already in Africa. They are, these are pressurized steam vessels with very special features. For example, the Ecodas has a shredder inside the vessel, while the hydroclave has a mixing arm inside the vessel to break up and mix the waste. The rotoclave rotates, the entire vessel rotates 
causing the waste to fall against sharp fins, which break up the waste containers. The middle photo, um, the, the middle photo uh, is an example of a microwave system called Bertin, which can also be found in various countries in Africa. It has an internal shredder and uses microwave energy to create steam. The two photos on the right are examples of continuous steam treatment systems used for very large treatment facilities. In this slide, the images on the left show a frictional heat treatment system. The middle gives an example of a chemical treatment system, in this case, one that uses ozone. Ozone is a powerful disinfectant that safely decomposes to oxygen. The photo on the right is an example of alkaline hydrolysis. This technology combines a hybrid autoclave with alkali to destroy pathological waste, including anatomical parts, body organs, tissues from surgery, and uh, even human and animal remains. There are also special sharps treatment, uh, sharps waste management technologies mentioned in the UNEP handbook. These include uh, small technologies for point of care destruction and separation of the needle and syringe. With this technology, um, such as the one shown, the point, point of care solutions, uh, with these technologies, the separated plastic syringe and the needle can be treated separately in an autoclave and the plastic syringes can then be recycled. There are, by the way, pros and cons to each of these different technologies and to all the technologies I talked about. There are also dry heat technologies, such as the one shown in the bottom for treating Sharp's waste. The UNEP handbook discusses capital and operating costs. The capital costs of general categories of technologies are plotted in charts showing the cost in US dollars versus the capacity in kilograms of waste treated per hour. These are based on actual prices of technologies with a solid line showing the average and the dashed line showing the maximum and minimum prices. These are not intended to be definitive price charts since the prices change all the time, but they could give you an idea of the investment needed by a clinic, a hospital, or a city. For example, let's take the cheapest uh, non-burn technology, a waste treatment autoclave. For a clinic or small hospital with less than 100 beds, a waste treatment autoclave will cost about 3,500 US dollars. For a medium to large hospital with 400 beds, the cost is about $20,000. For a large hospital serving as a cluster treatment, treating uh, waste from the smaller hospitals and clinics, the, the technology there could be around 70,000 or 80,000 or higher, depending on the size. And for a central treatment uh, facility, it depends, of course, on how large. If we take, uh, we'll call this a, a small or medium treatment facility that can treat 500 kilograms of waste per hour, the cost will be about $120,000 to $170,000. By comparison, an incinerator that also treats about 500 kilograms per hour but has all of the pollution control equip equipment and all of the design requirements to meet the Stockholm Convention guidelines, that incinerator would cost about $1.5 million or 10 times more than autoclaves. As a quick uh, case study, let us look at the Grand Joff General Hospital, a 300 bed hospital in Dakar, Senegal, shown in the top photo. They constructed a treatment facility, that's the top left photo, and installed two 200 liter hospital vacuum autoclaves and a medical waste shredder, 
uh, to treat all of the waste from this uh, reasonably large hospital. Under the photo of the shredder, you can see a photo of what the sterilized waste looks like after it has been shredded. Uh, as part of the project, the Sangalkam Health Station, 33 kilometers from the center of Dakar, uses a small 50 liter vertical autoclave shown in the photo on the right taken during the installation. This is the Zoompak Central Treatment Facility in Accra, Ghana. On the left is one of their medical waste transport truck. You can see with the biohazard symbol on the truck. Zoompak is a public-private partnership involving a local company, a Turkish company, and the government of Ghana. Their very large autoclave can treat 1.5 tons of infectious waste per cycle, in other words, per run of the equipment, which is large enough, I believe, to handle the infectious waste in the greater Accra region of more than 4 million people. On the photo, uh, in the photo on the right, you can see one of the workers pushing a cart full of infectious waste into the autoclave. I would like to end by summarizing a few key points. Infectious waste comprises only 15% of all the waste from a hospital. Waste infected with SARS-CoV-2 is very easy to, to destroy, to disinfect. Hospitals should follow national or WHO classification and practice strict segregation to reduce COVID waste at the source. The zero waste hierarchy should be followed with the highest priority given to waste prevention followed by source reduction, reuse, and recycling. And preference should be given to non-burn technologies that do not produce toxic dioxins and other toxic emissions that do not release large amounts of greenhouse gases while creating opportunities for materials recovery and recycling. Details of these and many other um, topics are found in UNEP's new upcoming publication entitled Healthcare Waste Management and Treatment Technologies, a Handbook Incorporating the Impacts of Pandemics and Plastic Waste. This is actually the second edition of what used to be called the compendium. The new handbook is about 345 pages and it will be provided, as I said, for free through the UNEP handbook at UNEP website. And the handbook will be released around April, 2022. Thank you very much to all for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Emmanuel. It was very interesting to know about components of COVID-19 pandemic waste and how these contribute to global plastic pollution and how to prevent plastic pollutions from health, uh, healthcare uh, sector. And it's very uh, interesting to know the different types of technologies uh, for healthcare waste. Um, for those of you who have questions in English, please write them in the Q&A uh, functions. And for those who have question in French, please wait for discussion after the next presentation and use the raise hand function. So now let me invite Ms. Gladys Ngeno, who is a public health specialist based in Kenya. She is a specialist in healthcare waste management and has been critical in steering healthcare waste management in Kenya. She has consulted for UNDP on healthcare waste management on various assignments in Kenya a regional UNDP master trainer on healthcare waste management. She has been steering the adv advancement of healthcare waste management in Kenya and healthcare waste management policies and guidelines. Um, Ms. Gladys Ngeno, over to you. Thank you very much, Makiko. Good um, afternoon, uh, good morning, good evening, everybody. Uh, it's really nice to be here today to share some of the lessons from Kenya. And I want to also extend my appreciation to UN Habitat, UNEP, and the Africa Green Cities platform for giving us the opportunity uh, to share um, lessons. 
So uh, as we talk about uh, the COVID-19, I always call the healthcare waste the silent pandemic because uh, no one usually speaks, you know, for them. We talk about uh, how COVID-19 is impacting us as, uh, as, as, you know, as humans, the disease, but then no one th thinks about, uh, you know, the waste that comes from um, the pandemic. So uh, that's why this I'm calling it the silent pandemic. And just to uh, put into the context the aspects of healthcare waste management globally, uh, we know that about three out of 10 healthcare facilities lack health system to segregate waste. And in developed countries, one uh, in less than one in three healthcare facilities have basic healthcare waste management services. The COVID-19 pandemic has led to large uh, increases in healthcare waste. And really, this has strained uh, the under-resourced healthcare facilities, exacerbating the environmental impacts from uh, solid waste. Uh, at the same time, really, we look at the healthcare waste as we, we, how we contribute to uh, climate change, and we know that the health sector still contributes about four to five percent of total emissions globally. And really, looking at the assessment that uh, WHO and UNICEF. Uh, did uh, in uh, 2018, about 58% um, of the facilities sampled from 24 countries had inadequate systems in place for safe disposal of healthcare waste. And really, when we look at the, uh, the COVID pandemic, uh, we look at the injections, and uh, we know that about 16 billion inject injections are administered worldwide, and uh, not all the syringes and needles are properly disposed risking the needle stick injuries that contribute to HIV and hepatitis uh, prevalence increase. So when we talk about healthcare waste, it is a global issue and uh, not just uh, an Africa issue. But then uh, let's look at really the burden of uh, the COVID-19 healthcare waste. We know that about two, more than 200 million uh, confirmed cases of COVID-19 have been reported through the WHO platform. And many of these uh, require that, uh, you know, when they're being treated, uh, the healthcare workers must wear their PPE. Each case as well, uh, hundreds and millions or more people because of exposure to COVID-19, uh, the travel, the work or leisure obligation will have to undergo testing. And really when we look at the uh, vaccines, we've had over 9 billion doses of vaccines uh, being administered, covering about 35% of the global population. So to reach, you know, the 100% of the population, we would need more than another, you know, maybe 18 billion uh, doses of vaccines to be uh, administered. And this means that we are uh, increasing the amount of healthcare waste. And uh, recently, uh, as a um, Professor mentioned Ali, uh, UNDP um, did an assessment in five Asian cities and found that healthcare waste re increased about 10 times more than the normal average volume of hazardous waste. And this is usually about 0 0.2 to 0 0.5 kilogram per bed per day to about 3.4 uh, kilograms. And uh, looking at uh, the use of PPE, uh, around 3.4 billion masks are used every day. And we, uh, Professor has really explained the impact of plastics. And we know that these uh, um, uh, masks are actually uh, contributing to plastic waste. And uh, when we look at that, with also the pollution of terrestrial and marine ecosystems, that is something that we do expect that is going to go on uh, as we handle the pandemic. But uh, just to say that when we look at, uh, you know, the burden, we expect about 144 tons of additional waste, uh, comprising about 88 tons of glass vials, 48,000 uh, tons of syringes, glass needles, and 8,000 8, tons of safety boxes. And this is alluded in the WHO analysis of healthcare waste uh, impact on the COVID-19, a recently released publication in early this month. And um, uh, Professor had also mentioned when we look at Africa, uh, we've seen that most of the PPEs and some of the vaccines hid here. Uh, we've seen around 18,000 tons of gloves, PPE kits, 
and, and test kits coming here uh, from the UN uh, procurement as the report was released in November 2021. And uh, someone then you know, would ask ourselves, uh, as we you know, handle the pandemic, have we actually thought about the disposal for this waste? Um, secondly, what impact does this have on climate change? And that would mean looking at the whole chain from the production, the transportation, and even use and, and the disposal uh, of this system. So uh, some of the things that we are looking at is, uh, uh, we need to look at is how do we look at the whole chain and see how much that can be sustainable uh, moving in the future. And uh, just to repeat and reiterate this, I know there are many people from different cities here. I know we were all scared about, you know, uh, COVID-19 and, you know, everything that, you know, has such a COVID patient, we consider that infectious and really that increased the amount of waste. But just to note here is, uh, for example, vaccination. Uh, WHO recommends that really we do not need gloves uh, you know, when you're vaccinating uh, uh, a patient or, or even during the COVID-19 vaccination drive. But unfortunately, you know, uh, that is something that we are still using here um, in Africa and of course here in Kenya. Uh, and, and, and that's one way that we can look at in terms of reducing the waste as the professor has alluded. And I just wanted to summarize really looking at the types of COVID-19 waste what is required for their safe handling and treatment and what is in the uh, components. For example, the mask, the gloves and gowns, yes, will be considered um, infectious and they would require uh, safe handling and treatment using the different technologies Professor has alluded. When you look at the, the SARS-CoV-19 rapid antigen uh, test, that, we, that is <clears throat> considered as non-hazardous. However, a small, small component of reagent may require safe handling and disposal if you are dealing with large amounts. The PCR testing cartridge is the one uh, that is considered as a chemical waste and it contains uh, guadinium thiocyanate. And guadinium thiocyanate is a chemical waste. It is considered toxic and um, um, it should be handled as a chemical waste. However, most of the countries still handle it as an infectious waste. And we, when we look at uh, its um, impact on the marine and even on the skin and, and even inhaling, it's, it's a quite toxic chemical that should be handled uh, carefully. The vaccine vials are considered as non-hazardous and of course the needles are usually packaged as, as, an, as a sharps uh, waste. And uh, coming back to here in Kenya, uh, as of uh, January 2020, when we declared the COVID first case of COVID-19 pandemic until 18th um, of February, we've had about 300,000 confirmed cases with around 5,600 deaths reported by WHO. Uh, as of 21st of February, a total of 16,156,000 vaccine doses had been administered. So when we look at that, that means, you know, we have 16 million vials, uh, many thousands of um, syringes to be disposed. But then when we look at uh, the issues of uh, mask use ETC, if we look at uh, the population, especially the urban population would require daily use of the mask, about 28%, 28.5% 28 uh, of the Kenyan population live in urban areas, that means we will get about 14.25 uh, 14 million 250,000 masks in a day and when we look at the, the rapid antigen test and the PCR uh, cartridges uh, we've had about 3 million 827 872 tests that done so far vaccine virus of course and the needles will be about 16 million so when you look at this um, burden we ask ourselves you know what has happened and uh, of course only 27% of uh, Kenyans are fully vaccinated. And when we look at how the case management was uh, done here in Kenya, uh, most of the case identification was done in uh, primary healthcare facilities, either in dispensaries, in health centers, and also at the county referral hospital. So the case management was arranged such that the COVID-19 centers are either in the county and also at the national hospitals. And therefore means that most of the waste were pushed up to where we had the COVID-19 center then 
and the national hospitals uh, who at least do have some form of waste treatment. Uh, in terms of the policies and guidelines, I think uh, as a country, we also did a lot of work trying to think beyond, you know, um, looking at issues of infection control and waste management plan. This was done in August of 2020 to guide aspects of segregation of healthcare waste, and even the pretreatment and the treatment and disinfection guidelines um, that Professor shared earlier. We also developed an environmental and social management framework for COVID-19 health emergency response project. This was also done last year, just to come up with a framework on how the private sector, how the government is going to work to make sure that the environment and social management aspects of the COVID-19, uh, um, especially on environmental aspects are managed. And uh, we also did develop guidance on handling dissidents suspected of confirmed COVID-19. Remember when the COVID-19 started, everyone was even afraid to, uh, you know, hold funerals because of this, uh, the scariness about the infection. And uh, what was most important is really the guidance and on, 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 on rational use of PPE. I think this was developed early and helped, you know, with the reduction of the amount of PPEs that were used. And you would really find that uh, the national referral centers would have a majority of, of, of the COVID-19 PPEs that were used. And there were many other uh, small guidelines around that. And I just wanted to summarize about uh, management practices. As a, a professor has mentioned, minimization would be very key. As, 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 as a best practice for healthcare waste. And we did adapt uh, CDC guidelines on rational use of PPE earlier in uh, August of 2020. Uh, segregation, uh, we still segregated the waste, infectious and infectious and shafts. Treatment options, we still practice a lot of open burning in Kenya, especially in low, low facilities, in incineration, microwaving, autoclaving and shredding. And then we have the final disposal, mostly either ash pits or the, or the dumping sites. We do not have landfills here in Kenya. So what are some of the challenges uh, for this? One is the indecision of segregation practices. This has really been discussed that it was the main cause of uh, increased amount of waste. They were all considered infectious. Uh, secondly, is about 50% or 24 counties have approved method of medical waste treatment disposal at their county level, uh, either an incinerator, uh, microwave, autoclave and shredders are still uh, present, but the rest do practice open burning or incomplete burning. Uh, the other challenge is uh, the PCN, PCR antigen bottles are not segregated as chemical waste and I've explained the aspect of thiocyanide and how that can impact the environment, but also the healthcare workers. There has been also an issue with the shortage of biohazard bin liners and safety boxes due to our centralized procurement system. And uh, lastly, the aspects of technology, which we are discussing today. Uh, Kenya has adopted a uh, number of technologies. However, in terms of expertise, operation and maintenance, validations, they still have a challenge. So as we close, I think uh, one of the things that we need to focus on as a team that works around healthcare waste is how do we strengthen our coordination, monitoring and training on behavior change and investments, building on the actions of the WHO manifesto for uh, health recovery from COVID-19 and how you know we can work together with the UN, UN, UN Habitat and also the WHO to really support uh, countries to uh, recover from the uh, COVID-19 impacts. Secondly, we need to uh, target the national levels, promote a win-win scenario for keeping healthcare workers uh, safety, but also supporting environmental sustainability. So this is about really the rational use uh, and, and looking at even um, sustainable uh, production of PPEs. Uh, thirdly, the issue of reverse logistics for expired vaccines and also uh, the test kits. Um, uh, this, I think, is something that uh, we need to, to look at because countries are really um, uh, getting um, uh, much of this waste and there's no clear uh, guidance on how this can be handled moving forward. And, and, and the aspect of centralized treatment, I'm aware here there are 
um, you have uh, people from the cities. And I think in future, this issue of centralized treatment will be something uh, that we need to pursue despite you know, the investment. I think it's looking at the environment and the long-term cost. That is something that we need to focus on. Uh, second last is looking at the investment in local and regional sustainable PPE production. In Kenya, yes, we do have that already. Some of our local facilities are producing masks. And lastly, uh, uh, the issue of healthcare workers, uh, we need to continue capacity building them on safe management and appropriate use of PPE. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Ngeno. It is um, quite a shocking number how much PPE in COVID-19 healthcare waste has increased in Kenya and Africa as a region. Um, I'm really sorry uh, for the technical glitch for the interpretations um, for the participants. Um, English and French interpretation has somehow switched. Um, so for English, uh, for the English, stick to the French channel and the French, uh, please stick to the English channel for the discussions. I'm really sorry for this mixed up. So just uh, switched. Uh, so you need to select the opposite language that you want to hear. Uh, so now um, let me invite Dr. Emmanuel again for the discussion uh, and the Q&A and please turn on the camera for discussion. And um, yeah, Ms. Ngeno, thank you so much. Uh, we have a couple of questions uh, on the Q&A uh, sections. Um, so I'll read out the English questions. Uh, so Dorian uh, Tosi Robinson asks, uh, great to have all these available technologies. Still, the questions of financial arrangements remain. Who should, will pay for all of these technologies, knowing all the limiting factors, in particular in low and middle income countries? What pathways forward do you see? Um, so I will ask uh, first Dr. Emmanuel and then Ms. Ngeno. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, that's a very important question. Um, that I'm sure is in the minds of everyone. Um, I, I will begin by answering it in a sort of more general principled way and then give some uh, ideas for a more practical look. Uh, the, the main principled way I answer it is that every country at the national level and at sub-national levels needs to have a budget for healthcare waste. In other words, we often have budgets for uh, therapeutics or budgets for diagnostics and others. We cannot ignore healthcare waste because it's also a major disease, uh, cause of disease tra uh, transmission. Uh, that's the reason why uh, WHO came up with a policy years ago uh, where it basically said that every hospital and healthcare, healthcare facility has a responsibility to not ignore healthcare waste management, but to include it uh, in their budgetary process. Um, so that means that it's incumbent among us, like my colleague, Ms. Ngeno, uh, myself and others, to make uh, the health uh, facilities aware of this important responsibility. Sadly, healthcare waste management is often ignored or not even prioritized. So that's in a general way. And um, the second thing is uh, what was mentioned is we also need to look at what are the most cost-effective methods. So for example, and I think my colleague Gladys mentioned this, that um, having a centralized facility takes advantage of the economies of scale. So what I have found out in my studies is that it ends up being cheaper for if you add the cost of having individual technologies in each hospital versus centralized technology, it could actually be a cheaper way to go. So we need to look at that. Now, in terms of some other practical things, the WHO policy that came out, I wish I re remembered the exact year and so on, uh, but it basically said that the international organizations and the interna international NGOs and funders that are, uh, that are funding healthcare programs around the world need to set aside a portion of their funding for healthcare waste management, for the waste that will come out from what they are funding. Um, 
I'm still hoping more and more will be aware of doing that. And then there are other programs. For example, I had mentioned the Stockholm Convention. The Stockholm Convention, because it's calling for basically moving away from incineration to the cleaner technologies, has provided some funding through a mechanism called the Global Environment Facility. Uh, and so the GEF provides funding to a lot of countries uh, to be able to afford some of these technologies. So that's yet uh, another way. One last thing I'll say is that uh, for those at the lowest level, you can also think of waste treatment by breaking it down into small components. In other words, don't think of waste as one technology. This is true actually in general. You can think of sharps and think what are the technologies that are usually cheaper and smaller to handle your sharps? What will handle your infectious waste? What will handle your chemical waste? And then you break it down into smaller and more um, uh, affordable uh, uh, phased uh, program. So that's, that's how I would answer it. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Ungeno, do you have anything to add? Yeah, thank you very much, Professor, for that. And I think um, there's one uh, policy or principles of healthcare waste that we usually have here, what you call polluter pays. <laughs> And that means that, uh, you know, uh, the health facility that is generating that waste should actually have budget, you know, to dispose. But I think um, as we think about how we improve issues of healthcare waste, and uh, really now that we understand the amount of waste you can generate per patient per day, the costs of uh, waste treatment should be included in the cost of providing healthcare. Uh, to the population so that if you're having medicine, you know, the treatment and also add uh, some percentage to uh, the aspect of um, uh, treatment of waste. Um, as, as, as also um, uh, the issue of private and partner, uh, public, uh, public partnerships, and the uh, professor has also mentioned this, uh, this is something that we, I mean, the global uh, south uh, need to think about uh, uh, really focusing on centralized treatment system, how the government, you know, can support uh, private investors to have uh, that system like we've seen what is in, in Ghana, yeah, if that are done in cities, then, you know, we'd uh, really elevate the issues of open burning in, 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 and also poor incineration and really contribute to the wholesome uh, uh, aspects of uh, effective healthcare waste. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so next question is from Simon. Um, Simon, could you speak up your questions in French so we can translate? So um, everybody tune into French channel so to, to hear English. Uh, Simon, would you be able to speak up? Donc, j'ai toujours pas d'internet, j'ai un problème de bande passante, je suis désolée. Je n'entends rien du tout. Ouais, ouais, ouais. Ah. Ah, désolé, j'étais en, en mute. Euh... Bon, bah, redémarre. Re, 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 Redémarre ton, redémarre ton truc peut-être. Euh, attends, parce que là, du coup, j'essaie de voir s'il y a quelqu'un qui parle ou il parle pas le gars. Is there anybody speaking here? Simon, could you, Simon, could you repeat the questions? Okay, this seems like we can't hear Simone. Okay, let me move on to 
um, um misato mm -hmm. i wonder if i can just uh give my rough um interpretation of the question that i read in french okay that would be helpful um, which i if my french is correct it's it the simon is just asking uh he'd like to know uh, uh what is the use of the products that are uh recycled from the waste i think um that's his basic question and and so um uh to to answer the question uh I will make a distinction between recycling and reuse. So reuse means that you take the material that maybe has been sterilized and you use it again. So it could be a, a glass bottle or a glass vial and you can use it again as a, a vial or a bottle, not necessarily for the original use, but maybe as a glass bottle for something else. But when we say recycling, however, we're talking about something different. So let's take the case of glass. By recycling glass, we mean that we take the sterilized glass and it goes through a process where first the glass is crushed into small pieces. And then it, uh, and this usually happens in a glass recycling facility. Uh, and then it is shipped then to a uh, glass manufacturer, which, take, which takes the broken glass and makes new glass bottles out of it. And the new glass bottles could be anything from a drinking glass to a vase to another vial. You know? So it could be almost anything. It goes back as if it's new glass. Uh, the same could be said with metals. So if you have aluminum or steel or cans like that, it's uh, again, uh, usually it's just compacted, sent and remelted to form new aluminum or new steel. Um, and however, in plastics, when we mean recycling of plastics, we take the three plastics that we can recycle, we shred it into small pieces, we then melt it again, but when you melt it again to form a new plastic, it's usually very weak. So you then add usually half a smudge or more, depending on what quality you want, of new plastic that came from the ground from fossil fuel to make a new plastic product. And that plastic product could be anything, it could be a toy to another syringe, depending on what type of plastic it is. So I, I hope that answers the question. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Manuel. So there's another question uh, from Dorian. Um, in Kenya, do we have any indications on the relative uh, increase of waste to be managed during COVID-19 as compared to before the pandemic? Percentage of increase uh, for municipal waste and or hazardous waste? I think this question to you, Gladys. Um. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for that question. Um, so we, we've we not had studies yet about the increase of uh, the waste, especially on the central street, uh, treatment centers for COVID-19, either at the county or at the national referral hospital. And uh, right now we are still using uh, the WHO guidance and the UNEP guidance about the, for the 10 times uh, increment. We do not have, you know, recent studies on that. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. There are more questions that Simon has asked. Um, Jorge, do you want to give an attempt or we can move on to next questions? No, um, I, I think it's an important question, so I will uh, attempt it again. Okay. Uh, it's been many years since I did any French, but anyway, from what I understand, he's asking what mm -hmm. system is put in place to raise the awareness of the public regarding this new type of waste, which I assume refers to COVID waste. And then uh, for the for the face mask, uh, they can go, they can they start as a protective tool and now become a contaminating waste. So uh, so my response. Uh, that the reason I think it's very important is because all countries now need to take it very seriously. There, there has not been, sad to say, enough of this happening uh, in many countries. We need to make the public aware that there is such a thing as COVID waste and, they, the, and that the uh, face masks need to be um, treated as COVID waste. And so there, the countries have to have a, a system of collection 
where the people collecting it are also protected, and then a system for disinfection and eventually um, uh, disposal. Uh, the bulk of face masks is a type of plastic called polypropylene. I mentioned that polypropylene is one of the plastics that can be recycled, but because it's in the form of a microfiber, it is actually very hard to, to recycle at the moment. But we need to collect it to keep it from going into our oceans, into our canals, and so on. So this is, I think, a very important question that more countries need to put in place both uh, awareness raising and a system for collection and protecting both the public and the environment. Thank you very much. Um, anything to add, Ms. Ingeno? Uh, thank you, Matik. Uh, Ms. Sato. Um, yes, I think the, the aspect of uh, masks, uh, you know, being thrown everywhere. <laughs> It's common in every city, I mean, and, and of course with the pandemic easing, you would find that uh, there are many waste uh, masks uh, thrown all over. Uh, and as the professor has mentioned, uh, we, they, like in Kenya, there was a, a small campaign that we ran in the media about, you know, disposal of masks and uh, why we need to put it in uh, an infectious waste uh, container. However, you know, those facilities are not available, you know, in the streets and, uh, uh, and, and you know, in all the offices, you will find now that uh, the masks are actually put with the general waste, and that will be, you know, disposed of in the dump site somewhere, and, and that will end up in the environment. So I think the aspect of uh, public awareness is still an, a, a big uh, gap, and uh, uh, re looking at that and seeing how uh, we can support uh, uh, more countries to, uh, you know, educate the public on actually the aspect of plastic pollution in masks. I think that is something that many, uh, the public is not aware uh, ab about the risk beyond, you know, just uh, throwing it to um, uh, the container. Uh, and, and I think Professor has covered the rest of it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I also have a couple of questions. If you don't have any other questions, participants, please do type in the Q&A if you have any questions. Um, so I would like to ask uh, Dr. Manuel, um, like what are the advantages and disadvantages of decentralized treatment versus cluster or centralized treatment? You mentioned that this could be the ways to uh, save some financial cost, um, but if there's any other advantage and disadvantages, we would like to know. Thank you. Yes, um, the... Uh... Okay. Uh... The one of the advantages of a decentralized system is that the waste as infectious never comes out of the facility. In other words, by the time it comes out, it's already been treated. And so there is that advantage. Um, and uh, the another advantage is that whenever you have uh, a lot of facilities with their own waste treatment, um, it's possible that some hospitals that might be overwhelmed at a particular time during an outbreak, maybe be able to get assistance from another nearby hospital that might have its own uh, treatment facility and might be able to share and so on. So these are some of the advantages, uh, but there is a distinct uh, advantage on the centralized side if the, uh, from, an, from the financing side, it becomes in the end uh, cheaper. And this is not just the one big centralized facility, but even the cluster treatment I've worked on a number of projects wherein we computed what it would be to have one hospital and say five clinics and one small hospital. And if they can share the cost based on the amount of waste that they contribute, so it's a fair cost sharing thing, it ends up being actually uh, much cheaper and easier for, for each of them rather than having to pay the cost of the capital cost of one piece of equipment. So basically sharing the cost. Thank you so much. Um, having to know these disadvantages and advantages, um, Ms. Ingeno, what do you think are uh, the, uh, the approaches that could be taken in Kenya? 
Thank you, um, Misato. I just wanted to add another advantage um, uh, on the centralized treatment is uh, the issue of uh, environmental, minimizing environmental pollution. Uh, because if you have a one burning system within one city, it means you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, in terms of controlling pollution, that is also managed. Uh, and then uh, the issues of safety, we know that uh, you know, having several uh, treatment centers, it means you also expose more people and also more health Western plants to uh, the aspect of uh, the risks. Um, so going to your question, uh, it, what can be applicable in Kenya? Uh, when I look at the evolving uh, platform, especially on how health is now being arranged, being, having counties and national, and, and, and really how uh, the health system is uh, reorganized now, uh, I think supporting the first option will be supporting counties to come up with centralized treatment systems. And then and, and, and they're looking at uh, rearranging the whole system about transportation, uh, and, and putting up uh, mm. such pooled, we call them sometimes here pooled uh, systems will be very great. Uh, secondly, uh, I know sometimes uh, hospitals like the county referral hospitals that are quite busy uh, require maybe a, you know on-site treatment. Uh, so I think having uh, an on-site treatment that is focusing on the non-band technology will be great. And the, the third, uh, recommendation I have for my lovely country is uh, really to look at our toxic uh, contribution. If you, I know you read some reports from the Jeff, uh, uh, um, uh, pro, um, sorry, from the Jeff, Jeff project about the, our toxic equivalent contribution annually, it is quite high. And, uh, and as, as we even talk about healthcare waste, it's really to re look at uh, managing the both municipal and healthcare waste in a holistic manner, rather than you know having it you know quite separate. Let's look at it as a wholesome healthcare waste uh, waste management uh, systems. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I know there are some questions, but uh, as the time is limited, uh, I would like to um, thank uh, uh, all the speakers, um, and I would like to now close the sessions. Um, as Dr. Emmanuel mentions that UNEP is working with, um, uh, with Dr. Emmanuel to finalize healthcare waste management and treatment technology, a handbook uh, incorporating the impact of pandemic and plastic waste. While this upcoming handbook will focus on waste destruction technologies, it is important uh, that there are a lot to be done to reduce, reuse and recycle waste from healthcare facilities, as hopefully this webinar uh, tried to highlight. Um, and I hope this today's webinar was useful to everyone to learn about the environmentally sound practices and approaches, and that can be done at the hospital level. And I hope upcoming uh, handbook will be useful to many of you. Um, it will be published to UNEP website, as he mentioned, and we will disseminate through the channels where you come to know about this webinar. And again, thank you very much for the government of Japan. I forgot to mention in the beginning to support this webinar and the support of our work on this uh, handbook. And thank you so much everyone for participating in this webinar sessions. Uh, we will make this presentations and recordings available on the ACCB website. And we will have um, another um, webinar in a month's time on 24th of March at the same time about waste disposal. Uh, so I hope to see you, uh, many of you in a month's time too. Okay, thank you so much, everyone. Hope you have a good night, good evening, good day. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.